Let's look at what scripture teaches us about the charisms and the whole charismatic dimension of the church relates to the institutional dimension of the church. God in his wisdom gave the church two complementary ways in which the spirit makes her holy. Two different directions in which the wind of the spirit blows. That's the way Father Raniero Cantalamesa puts it. One is from above through the channels established by Christ, the hierarchy of church leadership that we spoke about, the bishops, priests, and deacons, and through the Holy Father, the Bishop of Rome, through the sacraments, that order established by Christ. That's what we call the institutional dimension of the church. But the Holy Spirit also blows from below, so to speak, through every cell in the body of Christ, where he chooses, through the charisms he freely distributes, often in surprising and unexpected ways. The charisms and the charismatic dimension remind us that Christ the Lord is the head of the church and that it is the Spirit who is the primary agent of evangelization. It's not our work. It's not something we decide to do. It's what the Lord is doing through us. So these two dimensions, the hierarchical and the charismatic, are complementary. Both are a work of the Spirit. The one through the established outlets of grace and the other through the surprise outlets of grace. The living organism of the church is a combination of both of those. At Vatican Council II, as I mentioned, there was a recognition that the charismatic dimension had been neglected to some degree in theology and in pastoral practice for a long time. And that had led to a kind of inertia among the laity. The laity had become very passive. They began to see their role, actually, for, for several centuries, the laity had seen their role as primarily that of receiving from the clergy. Coming to the sacraments, receiving the grace they needed, and then going out and just living their lives. And Vatican II brought to the, back to the forefront of the church's consciousness that the charismatic dimension is essential to the life of the church, and especially to lay people sharing in the mission of the church. So in Lumen Gentium, the Constitution on the Church, Vatican II says, it is not only through the sacraments and the ministries of the church that the Holy Spirit sanctifies and leads the people of God and enriches it with virtues. That's the hierarchical or institutional dimension. But allotting his gifts to everyone according as he wills, he distributes special graces among the faithful of every rank. That's the charismatic dimension. These charisms, whether they be the more outstanding or the more simple and widely diffused, are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation. To use your charisms and to see others using their charisms is profoundly consoling. It's a revelation, a manifestation that Jesus is alive and active in his church. For they are perfectly suited to and useful for the needs of the church. The Lord knows exactly what his church needs, and he gives exactly the charisms that are designed for the perfect upbuilding of the body. Years later, Pope John Paul II said this, there is no conflict or opposition in the church between the institutional dimension and the charismatic dimension. Both are co-essential to the divine constitution of the church founded by Jesus because they both help to make the mystery of Christ and his saving work present in the world. So again, we have neglected the charismatic dimension for a long time. We've thought of the institutional, including the grace of the sacraments, as the only way that grace is given. And the church is saying, re recovering what scripture teaches itself and what the fathers of the church taught, the church is saying today, the charismatic is also essential 
as a means by which God gives grace to his people. So let's look now at how we see this in the Acts of the Apostles. Well, throughout Acts, perhaps the charism mentioned most often is prophecy. Paul also regards prophecy as an extremely important dimension of the life of the church, a normal part of the life of the church. And so here are a couple of examples. In Acts 11, verses 27 and 28, it says, Now in those days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. Why would the Lord do that? Why would he have Agabus foretell the famine? Probably so the church could prepare. Just as in the book of Genesis, Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams regarding the famine that was to come after seven years of plenty, so Pharaoh and all of Egypt could prepare. The Lord wants to prepare his church for times of difficulty. And very often he does that through the charism of prophecy if people are using it. In Acts 21, 9 to 11, it says Philip had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. You remember Peter in his Pentecost speech <laughs> quoted Joel saying that the Lord would pour out his spirit on all men and women. So Luke wants to make sure that we get that point. It's men and women, old and young, who get the charism of prophecy. While we were staying for some days, a prophet named Agabus, same one mentioned before, came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this girdle and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. He's prophesying the sufferings of Paul. Now, did that mean that Paul would then avoid going to Jerusalem so that it wouldn't happen? No. Paul says, I'm going where the Lord wants me to go. Then why the prophecy? To strengthen him so that when it happened, he would be reassured that this is part of God's plan. It's not a wrench in the works. It's not a derailment of God's plan. Prophecy can be a great encouragement that way. Now, prophecy is sometimes foretelling the future, but more often it's not foretelling the future. It's words of encouragement and upbuilding. So in Acts 15, 32, it says, Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, exhorted the brethren with many words and strengthened them. Prophecy is God's now word to his people. Prophecy is not giving new revelation because since Christ came, God has given us all revelation of himself in his word, his son. So ever since the age of the apostles, there has been no new revelation. That's why we don't believe something like what the Mormons believe that God gave Joseph Smith some new revelation. There's no new revelation because Christ, the fullness of revelation has come. So prophecy is not giving new revelation. It's enabling God's revelation to be understood in a powerful way by this group of people in this place at this time. It's God's now word for building up the church. Paul speaks about the powerful ability of prophecy to strengthen and encourage in 1 Corinthians 14. We also see in Acts how through prophecy, the Holy Spirit directs the church regarding where to go and what to do. Paul is famous for his three great missionary journeys. Why did those missionary journeys come about? Was it because Paul said, I think I should set out on mission and I think I'll head to Turkey? No. It was a, a word that came directly from God through prophecy. It says in Acts 13, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. So notice there, 
in a context of worship, probably the liturgy, they're praying, fasting, they, they desire guidance from the Lord. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying some more, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. In this case, they laid their hands on them, not for ordination, but for commissioning, for an empowerment and an anointing of the Spirit for the mission that the Holy Spirit has told them they are to go on. That's how Paul's great missionary journeys began. So that raises the question for us, how often do we seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the direct leading of the Holy Spirit for any ministry or evangelistic endeavor or project within the parish or in any other area of the life of the church? Are we sometimes tempted to say a quick prayer and then formulate our plans and then ask God to bless and crown what we've decided to do? <laughs> or do we seek the Lord's initiative so that we are following what Jesus wants to do? for the expansion of his kingdom. During Paul's journeys, he continues to follow the lead of the Spirit. In Acts 16, 6 to 10, it says, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Wow, the Holy Spirit forbids them to go into a certain region. How? Was it by, by a vision or an audible voice? Or again, perhaps just a quiet inner prompting? or perhaps some obstacles that they prayed about and they recognized that's the Lord telling us not to go there. And when they came opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. So the Spirit hems them in. They can't go west to Asia, which is Western Turkey, or north to Mysia, so they go northwest to Troas. Paul is led by the Spirit every step of the way. And then a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia, that's in Europe, was standing beseeching him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. What's the result? The mission of the church reaches Europe for the first time, at least in a formal, organized way, and changes the history of the whole continent, ultimately, because Paul was following the lead of the Spirit and listening to the Spirit through prophecy. Now, it's also important to notice that although the disciples are following the lead of the Spirit, that doesn't mean they are independent of the leadership of the church. After each of his missions, Paul returns to his home church at Antioch and usually to the mother church in Jerusalem as well. He reports on what he's done. He wants to ensure that he is fully in communion with the leadership of the church, that he's not out there doing his own thing. So Christians on mission, which is all of us, always have to stay connected to and submitted to the hierarchical leadership of the church. So we see here the interaction of the institutional and the charismatic throughout Acts. We see the charismatic in the Holy Spirit initiating all these different steps, these surprises of the Spirit, like Philip's mission to Samaria, the conversion of Cornelius, Paul's mission. And yet, each of them is discerned and approved by the apostolic leadership of the church. It's a beautiful interaction. So there's a distinction between these two, but not a dichotomy. In fact, every form of leadership is itself a charism. Those who are leaders, who are ordering the functioning, harmonious functioning of the charism, they themselves have to be submitted to the leading of the Holy Spirit.